Merci, thank you, everybody. I have this here. So uh, this is my, my favorite coffee shop, actually. I, I'm at Luca like every weekend, uh, the other Luca. So um, this is fantastic. I've never been to Luca Sukumui. Can I just ask you all, like, um, your background so I know where to aim this? Like, are you all in the, involved in the field of AI? Are you all software developers? Like, who's a software engineer here? OK. And who uh, works for some kind of company that does something with AI? Everybody, okay, a few people. And other people are just general interested in AI, that sort of topic? Yeah, okay. Okay. So my, my, I'm certainly not going to you know, go into coding and like, talk about you know, how to write code for certain things. Um, so it's a more general uh, uh, lecture here. But I think what I'm trying to uh, uh, talk to you about today is how AI has entered into my professional career, how I uh, started my career, and how for the last uh, 10 years AI has uh, intersected with, with my career and the developments that have taken place over the last uh, uh, 10 years especially. So I'll talk to you about that. Okay. So, okay. Okay. So I want to start with my, my sort of boyhood vision of what, what I hoped AI would be, you know, growing up with, with Star Trek and, and, and seeing uh, what might be possible, you know, with the science fiction there. And certainly I think that's been in the, in the minds of a lot of us uh, who are involved in the AI field is this vision for could we create an intelligence uh, a software that's as smart as a human or smarter uh, than a human. And if we could manage to do that, I mean, that might basically be the last thing that we'd have to do. It would solve all of our problems. We'd be able to ask that intelligence to, uh, to solve climate change, to develop the next version of that AI, to engineer whatever machines or, or technologies that we wanted to after that, to answer questions about um, uh, uh, physics, could we unify gravity and, and quantum mechanics. Um, so with all of that um, promise, I, I think uh, AGI has certainly been a very tempting and, and, and fascinating uh, prospect for the last uh, you know, 30, 40 years uh, um, in, uh, in the software uh, field. Um, and in fact, the um, the question is a research question uh, of how to accomplish this. What is the correct way to go about achieving a, a general form of artificial intelligence that can uh, uh, speak like a human and have all kinds of general forms of, of reasoning? And um, you can see here, this is a, a, more, a recent article, even just from, from the last six months, still asking that question because it is an open research question of what would be the best approach to achieve this. Can we accurately bridge neurobiology to brain-inspired uh, AGI? Uh, and maybe I'll, at this point, uh, take a step back and talk about my background for a moment. So I'm Canadian. I, I uh, had a degree in computer science from the University of Waterloo. So for between 2001 and 2005, approximately, I was at, at the University of Waterloo. And um, subsequent to that, worked in, in financial software, which was the big uh, uh, hot thing at the time for about uh, 10 years. And, and the story that we, uh, we will talk about today will begin in approximately uh, 2013, 2014, when, when I start to uh, in, in interact with this question. So, so prior to this, what do I have here? It's a little blurry. But prior to this, um, prior to my uh, going to that university, we experienced uh, you know, these leaders in the field here. Here's Jeffrey Hinton, a few other guys that are a bit blurry on this slide. But between 1960 and 1990, um, the, the basic uh, uh, theoretical underpinnings of what we're now enjoying as the fruits of artificial intelligence were developed. So. Um, in particular, Jeffrey Hinton, who's a uh, fellow uh, Canadian, um, developed um, uh, a lot of these, these techniques in the 1980s that um, were at the time basically theoretical novelties and uh, enjoyed academic interest, but could not actually solve any real world uh, problems. And the, the basic uh, uh, issue, which we'll get to in a moment, of course, is just a lack of computing power. Computers simply were not powerful enough for uh, the, uh, the techniques that they were uh, coming up with. Um, and so as a result, the, the whole field was, as probably many of you know, um, uh, really not uh, an exciting uh, field, not a sexy field, not a field that people wanted to get into in computer science for many years. And this is one of the 
multiple AI winters that have been experienced. I haven't even gone back to the 1960s, but certainly between when, uh, when some of the deep learning techniques were developed in the 1980s and uh, when computers became powerful enough to exploit them, there was this AI uh, winter. And this intersected with my time at university. So I don't know if, if any of you were in university around that time, the early 2000s, but it, it's remarkable to contrast people who went to university <laughs> after that and, 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 uh, and before, because uh, AI was not a topic any undergrad wanted to do, right? We did not want to uh, uh, you know, learn about that topic. It was, it was not the, the sexy topic to talk about. Uh, instead, it was about big data, um, uh, re real-time programming, uh, we talk about Hadoop was, was getting into uh, a, you know, a technique that would be used with big data. Um, so these were things that were um, what everybody wanted to talk about, everybody wanted to do. AI was relegated to sort of the backwaters of the professional uh, world, uh, academic world at the time. Um, but then something changed, um, and I'll get to that in a moment. But prior to, uh, to that change, um, and after my, my time in financial software, I was really contemplating this question, was uh, what, what would be the path to artificial intelligence? How could I get involved in this field and not simply uh, you know, be involved only in financial software, which was interesting, but uh, my, my boyhood passion for AI was really, uh, 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 really making me want to participate in this. So around 2013 or so, I was really reflecting on this topic here. Uh, artificial general, general intelligence, what would be the right path to do it? Should it be through the abstract neural networks that, um, that are in vogue today? Or perhaps with what you can't read here, which is uh, synthetic uh, biology. Could we emulate biological organisms and use uh, that information, that technique, to create a, uh, an intelligence? Is there a way to do it this way? Do we need to uh, carefully look at the way that neurons are structured in biological uh, creatures to get some kind of insight into how uh, intelligence could manifest? And uh, of these two choices, I chose to go with this approach. And here I joined, at this stage in 2013, the Open Worm uh, Project, which some of you may have heard of. So this is uh, not Open AI, but Open Worm. Uh, open Worm was a, uh, and is still, a project to simulate the mind and body of the C. elegans nematode, which is a model organism used by academics. And um, it has only 302 neurons. I think this adds up to 302 if I pick the right slide here. And uh, it's a stereotyped organism, so every single instance of this organism, if it's not a, a mutant type, is going to have that same 302 neurons. And one of the uh, seminal um, uh, contributions to the field was in the 1980s when Dr. John White of Cambridge actually mapped this connectome. So he painstakingly looked at slices of uh, an electron microscope um, that had sectioned this uh, tiny worm. So I should say it's about a millimeter in length, so very, very small little worm. And he sectioned it out and mapped out every synapse uh, that connects every neuron to every other neuron and came up with this connectome, which has about 10,000 uh, synapses. And so you can imagine that that was a project that was very difficult. It took him about 10 years to accomplish it. And uh, these days, in a kind of um, a analogy to the, uh, the Human Genome Project, with uh, connectomes uh, uh, today, we can do that through using AI techniques. And we can uh, 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 scan you know, huge uh, segments of, of, of uh, higher organism brains. But at the time, it was an extremely uh, manual uh, process. And um, this had been done in the 80s. But nothing really had been done with that information. It was an academic uh, curiosity. So what, what uh, a few of us in about 2013 um, uh, started to do was, uh, let's think about, can we simulate, could we make alive that connectome so it's not simply just a database or a, a collection of data about, about which neuron's connecting with what other neuron, but instead actually uh, uh, turn that into a simulation and see if we can get actual worm behavior from that information. So here I am ah, with 
John White himself, this was one of the most exciting moments for me in my pseudo-academic career, was uh, being on the same board with, uh, with Dr. John White right here and uh, Stephen Larson who founded uh, Open Worm here. So this was very exciting, got to participate in this project. At first it was an open source project I volunteered on, uh, but eventually became executive director of the, of the project. And here's uh, Rex Kerr who's one of the uh, uh, top longevity researchers in the world. And again, getting to work with him was really cool. Um, uh, and uh, with this uh, team of people and several other academics, we, we made, uh, uh, I think, quite a bit of progress in this, uh, in this field. And what's interesting is I want to caution you. I'm not a, I'm not a PhD, right? I, I did a bachelor's uh, degree, but I'm not a, a PhD in, 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 in uh, neurobiology or artificial intelligence. Uh, so it was very, um, very enriching experience for me to be involved in this project and to make a contribution to what I felt was a very important, uh, important thing. So what we ended up coming up with was, um, well, we got a Kickstarter uh, backing also, and we also ended up uh, partnering with the Royal Society and several other uh, universities and came up with this simulation of uh, C. elegans. Um, but there, there was a difficulty. And the difficulty was basically that although we had the connectome, which was the, the mapping of uh, where these neurons are synapsed with each other, the, the problem was we didn't have any information on the connection weights. So this is something uh, that has to do with what's called calcium uh, ions. And uh, if you have a particular uh, amount of, um, of, of calcium ions that are about to synapse, then it, it reaches a certain threshold and then the neuron will fire. And, it's those dynamics, those nonlinear dynamics that were very hard to uh, replicate in our simulation because we simply didn't have that data uh, uh, collected. And so, um, like many uh, projects perhaps ahead of their time, uh, we were uh, uh, limited by the fact that we could not actually uh, um, uh, uh, fully simulate the organism. But I think the framework was there and we were able to create some stereotype behavior with the worm, including foraging and, um, and, and feeding, but the entire repertoire of, uh, of, of worm behavior, which is remarkably complex for a creature with only 302 neurons. It can avoid predators, it can look up, it can uh, do a mating, it's a hermaphroditic organism, but there's also some, some males. And it was, um, it, was, uh, it was a very complex organism, it turned out. Uh, and one other um, difficulty with the C. elegans is um, although it's got a small number of neurons, 302, um, it, it turned out that the, uh, the size of the neurons are extremely small, so it can only be imaged with an electron microscope, which makes um, real-time analysis and imaging uh, very, very difficult. So um, that was another big challenge. There are other model organisms that have physically larger neurons that are just easier to monitor. And, and there are other projects that are trying to simulate, for example, the visual cortex of uh, Drosophila, the, the fruit fly, and other, uh, other projects like this. So I think there's an interesting project. Um, feel free to jump in with questions if any of you have some. But uh, yeah, OK. So that was my open worm uh, journey. Let's see if we have more. OK. Why am I losing my, uh, do you have an internet connection, Yago? Maybe that's why I'm not uh, getting my, uh, my beautiful images. Um, so let me talk about this. So in around 2017, uh, and again, I think my journey kind of mirrors the, the, the world of AI a little bit, because in 2017, I decided, okay, open worm, I'd had my experience with that. We'd, we'd reached a certain uh, um, uh, plateau, I should say, with the, the limiting, uh, uh, limited amount of data that we could uh, model. And so, I decided to jump ship and go to Asia. So this is, I've been here now for about seven years, since about uh, 2017, and um, there you go. Yeah, so I founded a company called Fling AI, and we're still around uh, today. And one of the projects that we first got a lot of traction on was working with the state enterprise here in Thailand, EGAT, to do uh, power line inspection with drones. And one thing that you've probably, those of you in the field have uh, uh, learned is that um, doing uh, IT projects with uh, uh, large enterprises is um, difficult, perhaps, to do business development with that. But if you throw in the word AI, and especially drones and AI, as we discovered, it's easier to, uh, to 
uh, convince a large enterprise that they can't do it themselves. There's a perception, of cer certainly six, seven years ago, that AI was a very difficult thing for an organization to do by themselves. I would say that's probably changed now to a great extent. Uh, now we're, I think, seeing uh, with the, the explosion of tools that are available, I think even internal teams with large enterprises are, 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 are feeling more confident in their ability to develop their own internal AI tooling. But at the time, certainly, um, this was something that was inconceivable for a large organization to do. So uh, we assembled a team here in Thailand and, uh, and developed uh, uh, this, for example. We're able to um, uh, detect defects in the, um, in the uh, power line infrastructure, including um, uh, flashovers here, cracks, and other defects. And this is, um, of course, using a radically different technique than our biologically inspired AI that I've been working on, but instead just your, your bog standard uh, object detection using uh, you only look once uh, YOLO uh, techniques. And um, it's only gotten better in terms of the, the underlying algorithms and techniques and, of course, computing power uh, since we started this. So the, the accuracy is just uh, that much better. We can accomplish it in real time uh, without um, later post-processing, and it's, um, it's extremely reliable. So instead of having to manually analyze thousands and thousands of images, as they used to have to do, uh, now it can be uh, done automatically, which saves an enormous amount of time. So I think what really changed things was our Lord and Savior, Jensen Huang, with, uh, with the, uh, the advent of more and more powerful uh, GPUs. So when, when we were uh, first uh, uh, doing our object detection uh, work, we were, it was all CPU driven, but uh, uh, quickly became clear that if we, if we use uh, uh, GPUs, then um, it's going to be a, a lot faster and a lot more effective. We can train a lot more easily too. Uh, so uh, th that's been a, a major, of course, uh, obvious uh, thing that's happened to make AI uh, more uh, possible in the last uh, 10 years. Um, and these are, again, this is an audience that may find this extremely obvious, but this is uh, very evident in the trend that we're seeing with the valuation. Um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it, it, was, it would have been very strange to imagine just a chip manufacturing company to have enormous valuations that are, that are up with what we're seeing uh, software companies have. And the fact that NVIDIA is here, you might argue, is a, a bit of a bubble, uh, given the, the current uh, capacity crunch with uh, chip making. But I think it's pretty clear that there's a, a comparison here we can make between Intel and NVIDIA, where uh, one decided to go um, to not uh, really invest significantly in GPU uh, uh, manufacturing, design, et cetera. And one, of course, is the, is the byword for GPUs. And you can see the, uh, the amazing difference here. And I think that um, it is, is a, a, huge, a huge part of that is because of the performance that we're seeing uh, improved. So this is on a logarithmic chart here. We're seeing the, the floating operations uh, per watt uh, are increasing exponentially over time with both the major uh, GPU manufacturers, AMD and NVIDIA, with NVIDIA still retaining its edge here. So, and this is just a 2020. So imagine how it's going after this. So this has really changed things completely for, uh, for companies like ours that uh, specialize in doing uh, object detection, uh, segmentation, classification, uh, image classification. Um, because it's just made the technique so reliable. Often I get asked, you know, what's your accuracy? What's your precision? And at this point, you know, we just say, you know, it's a matter of the data, obviously. If you have enough data, we can, we can be as accurate as a human or, or more. Okay. And uh, maybe I won't, do I, do I need to explain the difference between CPU and GPU to anybody here? Yes, I do need to explain that, okay? Yes. Yes, okay. So, so uh, and, uh, for the people who, who are not aware, that's no, no problem. Um, I think the CPU, I think we're relatively aware of, which is the central processing unit of a traditional uh, computer. It's going to uh, talk to the RAM and talk to the other uh, chips on the motherboard and get everything uh, done. It generally has a, um, a very high clock speed and it's able to do one thing at a time, keeping the architecture simple for a moment. A GPU, by contrast, is uh, much more analogous to a human brain in that it might have uh, slower or less high-performing uh, individual um, uh, 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 
uh, processing units, but it has hundreds or thousands of those units. And so if you hand it an, an image processing task, for example, just to get very simple, let's say you want to apply an, uh, uh, a sharpening kernel to an image. So you want to apply some matrix multiplication across the entire two-dimensional grid of an image. Um, if you would do this with a CPU, it would have to go pixel by pixel by pixel and perform those computations. Of course, the CPU can be very fast these days with uh, you know, very, very, very fast processing, but it still can't beat a GPU that can uh, divide up the task into thousands of subtasks and get them all done essentially instantly. So if you want to do image processing, um, uh, video uh, processing, all of that, uh, you definitely want to find a way to exploit the, the GPU in your, in your pipeline. And that's, uh, that's exactly uh, uh, what we've been able to, uh, to do at Flink. Okay. Okay. And then we got this in 2017. Attention is all you need. The landmark 27 research paper by Google. Um, all of these authors to attention is all you need, have since left the company and joined other companies or founded other companies, which is an interesting sidebar. Is anyone here from, like, work at Google or ex-Google here? Okay. You currently work at Google? Okay, okay, good, okay. So, yeah, I think it's a little, little amusing that Google, uh, which is a little bit like Xerox Park, right, where they developed the personal computer, all, the mouse and all the graphical interface and everything, but they were never in a position to actually financially benefit from it because Steve Jobs was allowed to walk around Xerox Park and, like, look at what was going on. They, they had no clue about the value of what they were creating, right? And I think it's the same thing with Google, where they've been paying thousands of, uh, essentially thousands, maybe hundreds of extremely expensive researchers to do all this advanced research, and then they let them all walk away. Like, it's uh, pretty analogous, I think. Anyway, um, then we got this seminal paper in 2017, and it turned out to, to really change things. And I, I had, uh, and I think most of my, my, my friends at Openworm as well, and colleagues at, at Fling, we just had no idea that generative AI would have this amount of, of success and that it would be this, this powerful. Um, certainly, we were kind of looking amusedly at um, you know, some of the images that were being generated with generative AI, but uh, the, uh, the chat GPT and everything else that, that came uh, as a result uh, uh, of that um, was, a, was a total, uh, a total um, amazing moment for us. So that's what I want to talk about now. Um, so there's a, a difference, of course, between what we were working on at Fling which is discriminative AI, which is discriminative AI, which is classification, where you're going to say, is this image a cat, a dog, a human, something like this? Detection, where you're drawing these boxes around items here. Or more advanced segmentation, where you're drawing a, you're able, able to segment out individual things. This is the kinds of techniques you would use for um, inspection, like we do, self-driving cars, this kind of, this kind of, now it's like old-fashioned AI, right? This is what, <laughs> what Fling is involved in. But of course, the latest uh, uh, exciting thing for the last two years has been generative AI. This is a very old uh, image now, uh, obviously, uh, with uh, better diffusion that, that can be improved. Um, and let's see if I have here. Yeah, so there's been a, been a massive evolution of GPT models. Uh, or sorry, of, of, of one particular uh, generative AI technique, which is generative pre-trained transformers. And GPT models have uh, improved uh, in a way that I think many people did not necessarily expect. So I think um, when I started with OpenWorm, I had this idea, and I think I was saddled too much with the analogy of how human intelligence is, is, is formed. You're a baby, and you learn things, and you can't speak like a professor or, you know, form whole beautiful sentences when you're a baby, but you, you learn slowly and you're able to, to eventually become a mature adult that can, that can uh, learn many things about the world. Like the analogy would be with a human where uh, to be able to speak like a professor, you need to have, you're basically, that's, that's at the end of your training process, right? Um, but with large language models, what's so remarkable, remarkable about them is that um, they don't have a, a deep intelligence. They can't necessarily do even basic mathematics because of the, the way that the, the token structure works. But you are, are able to ask them essentially any question you want about any topic on Wikipedia, and they can construct a, a reasonable answer. And that's just, if you think about it for a moment, it's a very alien kind of intelligence, right? It's not, 
it's not any kind of intelligence that we, we see with humans. Um, and it's scary and it's invigorating and it's interesting. Um, and I think uh, as a result of, of the, the whole revolution with LLMs, I think as a direct result, and this is my personal contention, you can disagree with me, but I think it's, it's led to higher productivity uh, in these companies and therefore tech layoffs. And I, I don't necessarily think that you can replace a programmer with uh, a large language model directly, but certainly even in my own programming, I've, and probably with, with you as well, you've noticed you can be more productive, right? Maybe it's twice as productive, maybe it's 50% more productive. And if you can be 50% more productive, then that means you know, you can divide the number of people that they need here by, I guess, multiply it by two thirds, right? If we look at the math there, right? So 33% fewer people are required to produce the same unit of productive work. And I think there's a direct correlation here between the, this, uh, this new kind of AI and tech layoffs. Um, and I don't think that's going to stop. I think this is an acceleration. And if I'm being completely honest with you guys, treating this as a kind of a confessional as well as a presentation, I find myself sometimes existentially worried about the career that I've chosen for myself as programming. I kind of thought programming would be the last thing to be automated, right? I figured, well, the last thing that'll be automated will be the, the programmers of the thing that is automating, right? Surely it'll be the, the janitors and the, you know, the easier things that, that, that will get automated first. But it turns out, that programming is highly structured language. Language can be handled by large language models. Uh, in fact, better than English almost because it's, it's so well defined and so well structured. And they can basically just uh, you know, handle a lot of the programming tasks that I would have thought would have been impossible. So this was a real revelation to me, if I'm being honest, um, and certainly uh, has illustrated the power of this technique. Let's see if I have one more slide about this. I heard something else about this. Yes, question. Most of the developers in industry are junior developers. Yeah. A uh, vast majority are. Um, and uh, I heard that uh, from some, uh, I don't know, maybe it's uh, not well researched yet, but uh, like tools like ChatGPT and Copilot, they help uh, the more senior developers more than they help, than it helps junior developers. Because junior yeah. developers are, they don't, they, they just kind of use whatever, they, they don't uh, have a, like a way to measure how good the situation yeah. is. I, I, so yeah, I agree. Yeah. accidentally like, create issues later on which would cause productivity to suffer. And whereas before, they had to like kind of slow down, uh, but read the box maybe more carefully or yeah. ask more questions. So I think it's, we still don't know. I think in the long term, it will definitely needs to, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll do much better than probably humans can. Yeah. But at this point in time, I think it's still not there yet. It's too yeah, I, I certainly i uh, am not trying to say that it's uh, perfect yet and that it's replacing all of us today. Uh, and I also totally agree with you that this is a more of a threat to the junior developer than to the senior developer. Uh, I think that I think that's also not just for programming, but for um, you know marketing, graphic design, consulting, a lot of other things. I, I, this is what I'm hearing, and probably you're hearing as well as um, you know lawyers even as well. They, they, a lot of the junior type grunt work that used to take a lot of manual work, creating these documents, uh, marketing materials, that sort of thing, is just uh, it can just be automated now. And so I think that's the direction here as well. But it's only a matter of time. And the, ex and the exponential trend is really uh, scary in a way. Like, I think you, it's easy to be sort of lulled into a sense of linearity and to have this cognitive bias that, oh, if you know, it improved by this amount last year versus this year, then it, the same will happen this year. But because it's exponential, I think it's realistic to be very concerned about uh, you know, the, the employment prospects even of senior developers in, in uh, five or 10 years. I, I suppose the one thing that... Perhaps it's a good thing, yes, because the, the, the one thing that's very hard to automate, of course, is, is the human interaction. If, if, if gathering requirements and interacting with teams and other things, that, that's, of course, may, will be maybe the last thing to automate. But the, the actual coding itself, which I felt was a very difficult intellectual thing, it'd be hard to program, turns out maybe, maybe not. Um, just see if I have something more here. How am I on time, Yago? See if I have, okay. Ah, 
I'll say a couple more things. Is it, can I speak for a couple more minutes? Is it okay? Yes. Okay. So uh, I, I want to, this is maybe a little bit random. This should have been earlier in the deck. But this is, again, back to what we do at Fling. Now, I talked to you a little bit about my shock with LLM, but now I'm going to take a step back and talk about what we do every day. And one thing that I think surprises maybe non-programmers is, uh, and this is, don't take a picture. This is our actual code that I just screenshotted today. But it's not that important. Uh, the um, the surprising thing is that I just told you I'm not a PhD, right? Not a, not, I don't have a doctorate in, in, in AI. And I think 10 years ago, uh, financial companies, Lehman Brothers, which I, I worked for uh, for a while uh, as, a, as a consultant for a software a consulting firm, they would hire PhDs to do uh, you know, uh, CNNs and um, uh, other techniques, time series AI to try to make predictions. And they felt that they needed to hire the actual practitioners, engineers that would actually construct the neural network um, uh, structures themselves. But with TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, lots of other uh, open source libraries, that work has been totally abstracted. So as a programmer, I, I, I will admit to you today, I have no idea what is happening after this predict. Of course, I know in general what, what kind of is happening. But I have to admit that I don't really know what's happening after I, I, I write predict here. I just know that I need to feed it an image and it spits out some structured data that then I process. And when, when I interview people who want to do internships at Fling or I talk to prospective uh, companies, they often want to talk specifically about the programming of the AI and, and how difficult it is. And of course, they assume in a, in a project management uh, uh, context that 95% of our work is going to be programming the AI piece of the work, right? But I, I, I I don't have the heart to tell them sometimes that actually 95% of the work is just the, the, the cleanup and the organizing and the moving of the data from one place to another and transforming one data um, type to another data type and managing dependencies and installing things and managing Docker containers and, and, and DevOps, et cetera. And that's 95% of the work. And the AI is dot predict. So I thought that was a bit funny. So maybe don't tell my customers that that's how easy it is, but OK. And I, but this, I do think that's disappointing for our interns as well, because they show up and they want to do AI, and it turns out that they, they have to go sit in the other room and count labels or something, right? But you know, whatever. OK, or, or label data. Ooh, that's, that's really uh, not good. OK, um, let's see. I guess I've already talked about you only look once. Can I tell you a little bit about what Fling does uh, now? We don't just do. Uh, 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 electrical power line inspection, which was one of our first customers to do with AI. Can I tell you for like 30 seconds what we do? So we, this is a warehouse behind here, and this is now what we specialize in, um, which is AI for warehouses. So we use drones. We fly around inside of a warehouse here using these fiducial markers on the walls so they can figure out where they're going. They fly autonomously inside the warehouse. And then we use artificial intelligence to count boxes and to read the labels, QR codes, OCR for the uh, information here. And we're able to generate a, uh, a stock check report for our customers. Let's see if I can go forward for that. And so as a result of that, we can go from uh, 80 people over two days that have to uh, manually go around a warehouse scanning items and, and uh, going up on reach trucks and scanning things to just uh, five people, engineers, in six hours bringing in some drones and doing the work. So that's the value proposition that we have for our, uh, our warehouse customers thanks to AI with a little help from drones. Um, I do have some beautiful videos here, but I don't know if it's going to show. I think no, right? OK, so sorry, you're not going to see my beautiful videos. Anyway, this, that's the report that it generates. And we're able to extract all this information with AI. Um, and, and again, count these boxes here. One of the big challenges with this technique um, is that we can only see the front. And we need to somehow find a way to uh, see the back and reconstruct the three-dimensional perspective here. And it turns out, uh, like with many things in AI, if you throw enough data at it, you get an answer. So that's sometimes surprising to people who say, oh, could we use you know, some, some logic techniques? Maybe if it's down here, if there's some light over here. It turns out I don't need to think about it too much. Just throw the data in. We have terabytes and terabytes of data. We throw it in, we train it, and it, it generates fantastic results. So thank you to Ultralytics for uh, YOLO V8 uh, for that. So I think 
I think that's the end of that. I'll, I'll, uh, I won't talk about my company anymore. But um, are your customers in Thailand? We do. We have customers in Thailand. Um, we we have uh, uh, most of the major 3PLs work with us, and we're also offices in Germany and Canada and Australia, as well. So. It turns out that uh, warehouses is one of the, the final fields for uh, digitization, digital transformation. Uh, finance might have been one of the first, but utilities and warehouses, kind of the sleepy, uh, sleepy uh, uh, backwater industries that I think we've been able to uh, achieve some transformation in. So that's kind of my journey uh, from student, ambitious, interested in, in artificial intelligence, AGI, and having the uh, privilege to touch the field in a couple of different, different ways with OpenWorm initially, and then with, uh, with Fling for uh, uh, discriminative AI, and then getting wowed like the rest of you with the uh, current state of affairs with uh, LLMs. So I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And I guess if you have a question, there's a question. Yes. Do you have any plan on using one of these uh, Gen AI yet? Um, we do talk about Gen AI for um, a digital twin. So we're able to take a lot of images, and then we use uh, neural radiance fields and uh, Gaussian splatting for reconstructing the actual three-dimensional built environment of the warehouse, which is always a big wow moment for the customers. We still have yet to kind of figure out what the real, like, material financial benefit is for it, but it looks really cool in presentations. And that was our, my video that I can't show you, but yeah, there you go. Yeah. So this may be less of an AI question and more about enterprise software. Yeah. Uh, with AGI specifically, people make it seem like it's going to be, once it exists, it's just going to take over everything, right? What do you think is realistic for it to enter the market? Is it going to be winner takes all? They have the AGI that does all the works, or it's going to take like years well, I've, I've heard people observe that on many metrics, already the, the LLMs that we're able to use, like Claude and, and ChatGPT4, are already superior or at least matching uh, human level intelligence with a lot of different things. For example, uh, um, completing like university tests, for example, uh, the, the bar exam, like they're already superior to us in a lot of ways, so I, but they haven't taken over every job yet. I think the real barrier for, for AGI to really take over is they can only really work uh, uh, most effectively when the, the work has already been almost completely digitized. So any job where it's like remote work, it's all done on a laptop, you can do it from the beach and there's no human interaction, I think that's probably the most dangerous job to have because that's the thing you can probably automate. Anything that requires you know, handshaking, human, uh, you know, human interaction, uh, talking to people, uh, that's going to be uh, significantly uh, harder, I think, to automate in the short term. But uh, I, I think we're, we're already seeing, I think some, someone was already saying they work on chat bots, is that right? And, and other uh, things. So I think that'll be the first thing. But um, you're right that the, the exponential trend probably uh, uh, can't, uh, won't be able to, to uh, uh, you know, automate all jobs uh, because uh, the, the, the fact that humans are not exponential ourselves. Our brains are not exponential, so it'll take us some time to absorb this technology into our economy, um, even if the technology is there. I felt the same way with drones for a long time. Uh, I didn't tell you about our first attempt with drones, which maybe you've seen in our videos. Back in 2016, we wanted to do drone delivery in Thailand, and we were actually the first to get government permission to do it here, but um, it, and we realized the technology was there. We, you can fly a drone and deliver a pizza you know, for six years now, we can do it. The challenge is the regulation and the people, and I think it'll probably be the same with, uh, with AI. Right, yeah. Anything else? I have yes. Um, so when you, uh, at the beginning you were talking about the warm and the, uh, the connecto. Can you speak loud? Yeah. 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 Sorry. I'll repeat the question too, but yeah, go ahead. So you were talking about uh, doing uh, this research about uh, that the worm yep. and the connectome and uh, trying to animate it or simulate it. Yeah. Um, and then afterwards, you and, and then came all the, the revolution in AI. Uh, did you get any um, intuition back then when you were working on a real brain? And uh, did do you find any similarities in like new AI uh, or generative AI? 
Well, so the question is, uh, I was working on, um, uh, with OpenWorm, with the connectome, and trying to simulate biological uh, neurons. W did, I, did I see some connection back then? Was I, did I have some inkling? How the brain kind of generally functions. Yeah, was the, was the, were those uh, insights that we gained then, did they have some influence on, on the, the future? I, I would say, unfortunately, no, frankly speaking. It was basically just a dead end in terms of reaching what we can achieve with, with, with uh, the techniques we have right now. It turns out you just don't need to have that amount of biological detail baked into your, your models. And it's far better to work on the, on the level of the mathematical abstractions that, that Jeff Hinton and other uh, uh, leading uh, AI uh, researchers back in the 80s uh, figured out. And you just don't need to study things that closely. Um, I, I, and this is, again, I'll talk about my personal prediction here. I think that we have enough software techniques right now to, to have AGI. We don't need to develop new radical new techniques. We just need uh, you know, Jensen Huang to give us a faster GPU. I think with just faster GPUs, uh, more parameters in the model, and um, you know, more, more transformers, we're going to be able to achieve basically anything uh, when it comes to human intelligence, which is surprising in a way, that you don't need the structures there. Again, that's my personal opinion, but it turns out no. And I don't know, uh, you know how, how to be existential about that or how to feel about that. It was still an interesting project, but uh, it turns out you don't need to study the human brain that closely or, or, a, or a biological brain to achieve human intelligence. Um, maybe the intelligence we get will be really alien as it has been so far and really scary and it'll kill us all, but anyway, that's what we get. Yes? I have more of a business point uh, question. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of the AI I've seen, they're, they're desperately searching for a business model. Right, and so, uh, and because the costs are very high in PC, right. uh, how does, that seems to be an element that we've never talked about in this kind of environment in the business model. It's hard because I've seen a lot of existing businesses, Salesforce, whatever, they just plug AI into an existing business model and add an add on module yeah. subscription service. How do you think AI companies can tackle the growing costs? Like you're accessing somebody else's event, right? Right. And they're going to keep on squeezing Well, I can tell you what it feels like from the perspective of, a, of the owner of a startup who that does AI, which is, I don't frankly worry about that at all. I, I watch that news with interest. But as you say, we, we plug into other models. We don't use LLMs, basically. Like, like the, the, the Gaussian splatting, the techniques that I'm talking about, they don't require the, the massive amounts of compute infrastructure to train that, that some of the LLMs do. So I guess I'm sort of insulated from that problem right now. But uh, what I would say, and maybe advice to people who are thinking of starting companies, who are thinking of doing it, is uh, to pick a problem domain and to be very, uh, to, to become an expert in a particular customer's solution, or a, a problem, I should say. Because when we focused on power lines, I learned way more than I ever knew before about you know, electrical transmission infrastructure and what are the challenges there, what they need to know. And we didn't try to you know, innovate on AI. I didn't try to make a better TensorFlow because I, I, I guess I figured that I'd never be able to do that. It's already, you know, they've already thrown all the best and most smart people in that. But what I can do is be really niche and really smart about a particular industry, a particular uh, company. So that was that. And then, and then with warehousing, the same, where um, we're just able to enjoy all the new innovations in AI and deploy them in our system without any fear that OpenAI is going to create a, a competing uh, warehouse stock checking thing. This is small potatoes for them. It's just too narrow a field. They're building tools for an entire industry. So we understand our place in the ecosystem, which is as uh, domain specific implementers of the technology rather than uh, innovators on the technology itself. And at least for me, it's a very comfortable place to be because I don't have to have a heart attack every time I see some new AI technique out there that's going to blow me away. For the, the service, uh, we can talk later. I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to give you the service. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It depends on the warehouse, frankly speaking. Every warehouse is different. I've learned that, too, is that there's no two warehouses the same. So I have to, have to, to say that. Any other questions? Maybe. Um, no. OK, thanks so much, everybody. Have a great, great evening.
and we are looking for a speaker, so if someone has anything interesting to share on AI, please contact and uh, enjoy your evening tonight, feel free to have a drink, and uh, you can stay here, uh, the place is yours, you can have network with other fellows here. Thank you so much.